Well, good morning. What a treat it is to be here with you. We are going to begin by reading our two passages in this series of Isaiah 61. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. And Mark 16, verses 1 to 10. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. I want to talk to you this morning about what it means to live a power-filled life. Don't we all need power as we live in this crazy but wonderful city, London? We need power beyond ourselves to live well. This last week, I was driving one of our daughters down the M4 at high speed when all of a sudden, I lost complete power in the car. Complete power. Couldn't accelerate, was trying everything. And um, as I was on the fast lane, which is where I'm normally, um, I found myself having to navigate over to the slow lane and then to the hard shoulder. And what interested me is the sense of vulnerability and powerlessness I felt as all these other cars zoomed past us on the motorway and we were just left there. And I don't know what type of week you've had. I've had a pretty hectic week. It's not been the most best model diary planning week in my life. Um, as you heard, we had the amazing day where my husband received his MBE at Buckingham Palace. Never thought we'd go there. And um, it was such a fun day. But the logistics around it, we had to get one of our daughters fly back from France in 48 hours. And I had morning meetings, conference calls. It was not the week for our car to break down. But sometimes we found ourselves in these positions of powerlessness. And what do we do? Well, Tom and I are based at Queensgate. And as you know, on a Wednesday and a Friday, we run the day shelter. And it is such an amazing thing. We went to visit recently, and there are about 150 people who come for the day. And they come just to come in from the, war from the cold to get warm. They have the opportunity just to read their papers, to sleep if they need to. And they have the opportunity to get warm clothes. And the best bit is they have a seriously great full English fry-up breakfast. And um, I was chatting to one of the guests. And he is a lovely man. And he said that he feels so tired, he just needs to sleep there. And I said, well, why is that? He said, I can't sleep where I live, ever. And through no fault of his own, he'd found himself jobless, which led to being homeless which led him being in some temporary accommodation where his adjoining neighbor was highly abusive and aggressive and would periodically kick in the partition walls and try and knock down his door. So terrified him he couldn't sleep at night. And here was this lovely man caught in this cycle, in this system, powerless to change it. How many of us in this city easily feel powerless to change our situation and overwhelmed by circumstances that seem beyond our control. I vividly remember a time when, one of the times when I hit rock bottom, when I felt powerless. I must have been about 14 years old and I remember finding myself going round and round on the circle line of the tube. I was just sitting there slightly in a world of my own, trying to process what had happened to our family 
in those few months. My dad had disclosed a secret life that none of us knew about, which involved affairs and deception, and he'd left. My mother was really sick. And from my teenage perspective, my life felt in chaos. I felt so disoriented, and I was just trying to get my head round what was going on, sitting on the circle line. And it wasn't that long afterwards that uh, I went to visit my father, who had moved into a house nearby. And I remember going to visit him and finding that he'd locked himself in, he'd boarded himself into this house. And all I could do was to kneel down and to flip open the letterbox. And I remember opening the letterbox and seeing him in his pajamas and seeing him unshaven, which was probably the first time I'd ever seen him unshaven. It was so unlike him. And he wanted, he was attempting to take his own life. And I remember kneeling, pleading with him through this letterbox, saying, you don't have to do this. We love you. There has to be another way. And wonderfully, he came through that time. But I will never forget the sense of powerlessness. This was way out of my control. Where do we turn? Where do you turn when you feel powerless? Well, for the disciples, they're at this exact moment. This is where we find them in this story. They have lost their leader but they have lost their closest friend. They have been with Jesus for the last three years, morning, noon, and night. They have followed this man. They love him. They have given up everything. They've given up careers. They've given up homes. They've traveled with him. And I just wonder if they suddenly are realizing the weight of despair and disappointment that maybe he wasn't who they thought he was. The authorities are probably after them. They are in a moment of chaos, in a moment of crisis. They are powerless. And you know, Jesus himself knew what it was like. He chose to give up his power on the cross. He chose to become powerless. And sometimes our circumstances can feel so against us, can't they? It feels that nothing can be done. And I bet this is what the women were feeling going to the tomb. And it's so interesting, this is the same group of women who had been with Jesus at the trial. You know, the other disciples had fled. These women had stayed with him. They'd heard the accusations against him. They had watched him being tortured and flogged. They had watched him being nailed to the cross. They were there, they had seen it with their own eyes. And they'd stuck with him and followed closely behind when his body, his dead body, was taken down and was laid in the tomb on the slab. And they wanted to go back because they knew where to find him. And as soon as that Sabbath was over, as soon as they could go, they got up early and they said they'd get their spices to combat the smell of the decomposing body in the heat. And I love it because it's quite clear they haven't really thought this through. You know, they've left early and it's only when they're on their journey that they suddenly say to each other, who's gonna move the big stone? They haven't got any male disciples to help them. They had no idea what they were about to step into. They had no idea what to expect. And I would love to have seen them as they round that bend and they see that that stone is rolled away. It's not in front of the tomb. And then what's more, they go in. And I, I wonder if they're just taking a moment to emotionally prepare themselves to see the dead body again of Jesus that they so loved. I wonder if just before they step in there, I would have been like, okay, this is it. And they go into the tomb and what do they see? They see this angel, we're told it's a young man, angelic being, sitting on the same slab that Jesus' body had been laid out on. And I'm not surprised they were terrified. But what's even worse for them is he then speaks to them. And he says this, Jesus, who you're looking for, he isn't here. He is risen. I mean, what does that even mean to them? I mean, they've got no form of reference to that. And I so understand 
that these women fled. It says they ran. I would have sprinted. They were terrified. They were shaking. They were petrified. What had they just seen? What? I mean, how could they process what this could possibly mean for them? God had done the unimaginable. He had done the totally impossible. He had broken the power and the finality of death itself. Up to this point, death had always been the last word. And you know, the resurrection of Jesus, it's not the fairy tale, it's not the children's Sunday school story. It is a shocking, deeply shocking impossibility. It's never happened before, it will never happen again. And I wonder if it should maybe leave us slightly trembling and speechless as it did the women at the tomb. The resurrection of Jesus is the most significant event in history. It is the most unlikely, implausible, unimaginable, mind-bending, concept-changing, reality-breaking event that has ever happened in the history of mankind or of the world. Because, because a power greater than death has made itself known. This moment, friends, changes everything. And that's what must have hit the woman at that moment. If God can raise a dead body to life, it means that there is nothing that he can't do. It means that every situation, every circumstance, every obstacle, every challenge that you and I face, he can transform completely by one move. And you know, I find it so easy to underestimate the power. I find it so easy to not comprehend the potency of what God can do. And I recall the first time I think I probably ever glimpsed a little bit of that power. I was at a John Wimber meeting, and you might recall John Wimber was an American pastor from Anaheim in California. He started the Vineyard Church movement. He was a great friend of us at HTB and really had an impact on our church. And I was at this meeting where he said, you know, I believe, in his wonderful American accent, I believe there's someone here with a cleft palate that God wants to heal. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, that is a seriously big ask. Actually, if I'm honest, cynically, I probably thought, I think that is really inappropriate because that is just setting false expectations because there is no power that could do that. But to my shock, the man sitting in the chair next to me put up his hand saying he had a cleft palate. So before I knew it, I was scooped into the prayer team. There were about eight of us, I think, around him. And uh, there was a sort of floating doctor going around and we called him over and he kind of inspected and had a look and realized that there was no bone. There was no palate at the top of this man's mouth in this cavity. And they taught us to just lay our hands on and pray, come Holy Spirit, with the power of the resurrection, create a palate. And all I can say is I did not take my eyes off this man for about an hour and a half. And while we were praying for him, the heat that came out of him, I mean, we all had to step back. It was boiling. He was like a furnace, absolutely boiling. And then I heard the cracking. I heard his bones in his face start to crack. And I saw his muscles and his jaw involuntarily moving as we were praying. And you know, from time to time, we would get the doctor over and we'd stop him and we'd say, oh, excuse me, just have a look. And we'd all peer in, we'd see what's going on. And um, sure enough, one more centimeter of bone had grown. An hour and a half later, that man had a pallet. It was the power, oh, thank God. I'd never seen anything like it. I never thought anything like it was possible. It was impossible in my experience, but I had underestimated the immensity of God's power. And I can assure you there were lots of tears of joy that night. And Isaiah 61 says, a dead seed will spring to life. 
And that's at the heart of both of our passages this morning. The Holy Spirit is at work in power to do things that you and I could never ever imagine. This little acorn, this little seed, I don't know if you can see it, it's really quite tiny. It is tiny, it is hidden, it looks dead. To me, it looks totally insignificant. And yet Isaiah says, God is gonna raise it to life. And it's the foretelling of what Jesus is gonna do at Easter that Jesus' body that is insignificant, that is broken, that is dead, that is in that vault-like tomb is gonna come back to life through the power of God. Life would come out of death. And what I love about this little acorn is it really doesn't look like much, but this acorn has the potential to become a giant oak tree. It has the potential to be an oak tree that is deeply established, that brings shelter, protection, the seed that breaks through the dark soil is Jesus, bringing life and hope to you and to me. And I love the way that Revelation describes Jesus' work like a giant tree. And he says, says that the leaves are for the healing of the nations. Wow, I mean, that is a big tree. And I love that song. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Oh, death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. When the Holy Spirit is at work, miracles begin to happen. And if the Holy Spirit can raise a man to life, there is nothing, nothing that he cannot do. When the Holy Spirit powers is released, marriages are restored. Tom and I had the fortune of going to a wonderful celebration recently of this couple, and during their speeches, they explained how they went through a seriously rocky time in their marriage. They were living separate lives. It was pulling the family unit apart. They really didn't like each other. And they then went on to say it was only because of the intervention of God's Spirit in their circumstances and in their hearts that he rebuilt their marriage and that they could celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. When the power of the Spirit is released, our practical situations change. I met a girlfriend a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago, and she's got a real desire to head down this certain career path, but in order to do that, she needs training. And she'd applied to everyone she could think of to get funding for this training. And the day I met her, she just received her final no. And she just said, you know, that's my dream. That's my future. What am I going to do? It's gone. I, I can't do what I, what I feel I want to do. And we prayed together. And we prayed for a miracle. Last week, she bounded into church, the hugest smile on her face. She said, Sarah, I've had a miracle. It's a miracle. Some unidentified funding had become available, and they'd given it to her. God can change our circumstances. When God's power is released, addictions are broken, lives are transformed, even political situations can be transformed. (laughs) Do you know, I don't know what you're feeling about Brexit. I mean, probably in this room, we have got quite a mixture of feelings on this. But what I feel is that we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our nation at this time. I want to say thank you to you prayers out there. I want to say thank you for those who are praying for our nation. You know, I love those stories in World War II when we were right on the back foot, where the RAF was depleted, where we were right on the edge of defeat. And the church prayed. The church prayed. And God's power protected us. I want to encourage you, if you pray for our nation, God's power is greater than any geopolitical force. Let's pray that God would bless our nation. And when the Holy Spirit is released, he has the power to rewrite history. A couple of months ago, two months ago, on the 7th of September, I read this article in The Independent. I don't know if any of you saw it, but the headline goes like this. Happy reading. Church of England staring at oblivion as just 2% of young Britons say they identify with it. 
UK's national religion facing unrelenting decline, research finds. What I found so extraordinary, that was the very month, September, when we launched two new churches in Bristol and Southampton. And I believe that Jesus is very much alive in our nation, that we are not heading over a cliff. And I believe that every church, that CRT, that HDB plants, everyone is like a seed going deep into the soil. And we might only see a tiny little shoot coming out, but there is gonna be an oak tree. And it's gonna be an oak tree that brings blessing, healing, protection, a new life for communities and cities around our nation. And I believe in the words of the angel, each church plant shouts out, Jesus is not dead. He is very much alive because he is risen. But you know, circumstances don't always go the way we want them to, do they? We suffer disappointment, it's a reality. And in my life it can be as mundane as having to queue for the shower because of the amount of people in our house or being stuck behind an Uber driver in London traffic. But more recently I had the privilege of praying with a number of our congregation who are facing significant medical challenges. I can think of two who've effectively been told that the medical profession can no longer provide them any source of hope. There are no further drugs or treatments available. And I met with one of them last week and we were talking and, and he was just saying and trying to come to terms with the idea of leaving his loved ones. But you know, he had such an assurance and a peace that I thought it could only be the power of God that you and I and he can face death assured of his eternal life. And I don't know what circumstances you were facing in this room this morning, whether large, whether small. But I wanna say if God can raise a man from the dead, he can meet every single one of your needs. He can meet every single one of your situations. He can break through every single one of your obstacles. What I do know is that the power of God is bigger than any obstacle that we're facing. And we're told that the very same power that raised Christ from the dead is where? It's in us, it's living in you and in me. And I mentioned that our car had lost power, but there is nothing better when your car is broken down on the, on the shoulder for the AA van to arrive. There is nothing better when the AA man gets out and he brings a big battery and he plugs it into the engine. It's like, woof, and you're like, we can start driving. We are good to go. The Holy Spirit is the cosmic battery pack for the whole universe. God is overseeing. He makes the sun rise every day, the rain rain. In his grace, he is overseeing all of creation. And we, you and me, are offered the opportunity to plug in to that resource, to plug in to that power every day. And if we choose to, we can just invite the Holy Spirit to fill us, and we too can experience resurrection power in our lives here in London, day to day. And I wanna tell you about my good friend, Teresa. In 2008, in April, she was framed um, for fraud. She was innocent, she was framed by her employer, and she was prosecuted and she was sent to prison. And she was sent to prison in Langata Women's High Security Prison in Nairobi, in Kenya. She had just given birth to her baby daughter and the two of them were put into prison. She felt totally powerless. She felt silenced. The police wouldn't listen to her. The judge wouldn't listen to her. And she was there with this newborn, unable and powerless to protect her daughter. All she could do was pray. And she was longing for one person to believe her innocence, to help her back to freedom. And Teresa is one of the most beautiful and prayerful women I've ever met. And God answered her prayer. And after a year, she was released. 
And after five years, her conviction was turned around and she was proclaimed innocent. But what is most amazing to me about Teresa's story is what she's doing now. She is going back into those very prisons in East Africa. She has taken the spear course developed in London and she is using it to give a voice to women and a hope. Now, quite frankly, if it was me, it would be the last place on the planet that I would choose to go back to, a place that has been a place of injustice, of despair. But God has brought life out of death. He brings hope in the darkness. God's power changes everything. And I wonder what you think looks dead in your life this morning. God is able to raise it to life. What dream you have let go of, he is able to raise it back to life. God has a plan for each one of us, each one of you. If we turn to him, if we trust him, if we welcome him into our lives, we too can plug in to his power. Who here, I wonder, wants to know and experience the power of the resurrection? Where do you need power today?